much. Hope. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm going to do a quick introduction. Um, who am I? Well, I'm, I'm quite busy in the open source world. I uh, maintain 20 or so packages in Debian and uh, quite a few of those are my own bits of software. I'm currently a principal engineer working at Intel. Um, um, and before that, I used to be a, a senior kernel engineer at Canonical, um, working on kernels, fixing bugs, and basically getting my hands into lots of different kernel problems and trying to get them sorted out. Um, I've done quite a bit of upstream work. Mostly now it's janitorial work, kind of fixing trivial bugs, which I find is static analysis. Um, before that, before working on kernel bug fixing, I um, started working on um, laptops and trying to fix firmware issues. And so I started writing the firmware test suite. So that's a tool for checking bi biases. Um, and that really led me on to developing stress and as another tool for finding and fixing, but well, finding bugs in the kernel. So my kind of history is I really like finding and fixing bugs. And I really like it when people send me new hardware because I like trying to break kernels on new hardware. Um, so yeah, I am people in the past have given me lots of nice bits of kit, which I've tested things out on and broken kernels on them. So that's kind of my background. Um, so on with the show. So can I have the next slide, please? Right, so a long time ago, about 10 years ago, um, we, we, we were looking at laptop issues where um, when I was in Canonical, we had issues with laptops getting a bit too hot. And we, we I used the stress tool, which was kind of cool. Um, it's a great tool written by Amos Waterland, but I wanted to add some more tests to it. So um, I started reworking stress ng, uh, stress ng adds stress the next generation, hence its name ng. It's not a brilliant name, but you know, there we go. And um, the whole intent where there was to make um, laptops really busy, um, see if we can burn CPU cycles and hammer the memory and cache to make laptops overrun with thermal temperatures. And um, we kind of did that, and that was really to complement the work with the Intel Thermal Demon, which is a tool designed to keep laptops from overheating. So Stress and G was really designed to make Intel Thermal D work hard and make sure that laptops didn't get hot before they went into production running Ubuntu. So that was the original int intent. Um, but like all projects, they grow in scope and new features get bolted on, and the tool has grown over a decade. So um, it's just interesting there. At the bottom right, there's a picture of a Raspberry Pi being exercised with stress NG, and you can see the red parts are quite toasty and hot. So that's the intent. Make things hot, see if we can break things. But no, stress NG has kind of increased in functionality. So let's look at what else it adds. If we look at the next slide, please. So what does stress NG do now? Well, I've really designed it to break and crash kernels. What I mean by that is I want to make um, stress and G exercise memory cache, all devices, file systems, hammer away on all the different types of kernel interfaces, that's system calls and um, SysFS and PROCFS entries and so forth. I also want um, stress and G to exercise memory in the scheduler and IO and basically hammer a system as hard as we can. So we exercise those weird corner cases where resources are low and bugs seem to pop out. So um, with that, um, we also exercise things with currency. We stress and is designed to run multiple processes and really exercise um, race conditions in the kernel to see if we can cause lockups or weird, weird null pointer dereferences because stuff's been freed while another process is still working on it. Um, the last couple of years, I've been really also working on making Stress and G more portable. So it should build on most POSIX systems quite easily. And I've also made it compiler friendly. So it builds on multiple compilers. Um, so what is Stress and G now? Well, really, it's like a sledgehammer. It cracks kernels, it breaks them and finds bugs. And it's also a Swiss Army knife because it's got rather a lot of functionality and it's it's like not one purposeful tool it's got lots of purposes so without further ado let's look at a bit more with the next slide please so here's an example you know we don't just break the linux kernel although i am mainly working for the linux kernel with stress and g um, stress and g has been known to also break other kernels so this is a bug which occurred in dragonfly bsd and oh dear spin lock bit of a panic and it's broken. And can we look at the next slide, please? 
And this is op open Indiana or basically the Solaris kernel. And, you know, Solaris, I used to think was like a rock, rock hard kernel. You could never break it. But oh dear, I managed to break it with StressNG uh, on a file lock operation here. So yeah, StressNG being portable means you can test other kernels other than Linux. But as I want to kind of focus on, it really has been designed for Linux and then other systems. Um, if, it, if, if, if I can support those, then I'll try and get that working. So next slide, please. Right, here's a quick overview of the StressNG design. So on the left-hand side, there's a box which shows you the main kind of structure of the stress and G main part of the program. So it sets a timeout alarm, then it forks off a stressor process, and I'll describe the stressors later on. And then it waits for the stressor to complete, and then it reports any metrics such as BOGO ops or memory consumption or how long it's run for. And on the, on the middle part of the slide, we've got how a stressor instance works. So basically the stressor initializes and allocates any resources it requires, such as mutexes or opens files or so forth. And then it basically spins on a very simple stressor loop. And that basically checks if a alarm has occurred, tell it to stop running or a sigint, like if you hit control C or if the BOGO op counter has been reached. So the increment counter increments the BOGO op counter for every loop around the stressor loop. And you can, you can tell StressNG to run, say, for a set amount of BOGO ops, or you can make it run for a certain amount of time. So the time part is where the alarm works, and the BOGO op counter um, is where the increment counter and keep stressing check checks for the number of loops you do. And then when the stress is finished, it cleans up, writes some statistics into some shared memory, which the main process can read, and then it exits. So that's about it, single stressor instance in this example, but StressNT can run with multiple stressor instances up to 4,096, and those stressors can be any type of the, any of the 280 stressors which are written into StressNG. So this, is, this example here just shows you one stressor running, but imagine StressNG running lots of stressor instances in parallel, and that's where we can scale up the ability for StressNG to really hammer a system and try and find bugs. So can I have the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, StressNG now comes with over 200 um, stressors. So these stress tests are, um, cover a lot of uh, the kernel space, and they do lots of different things. And when you combine them, you basically got a very powerful ability to hammer a system and try and force bugs. As I said earlier, you can run one or more instances and they could be run in parallel. And each stressor um, of the 228 cases can also be run in parallel. So you can run a mix and match stress tests, run them in parallel. Um, the stressors are focused. They, they basically do one thing and try and do that well. So um, a stressor will not try and do lots of different things. It tries to keep focused on one particular stress scenario, such as exercising memory or exercising cache or exercising the CPU in a specific way. And StressNG also, when it's terminated, um, it can report lots of different types of stats. So StressNG can show you the load average, it's got the ability to dump out perf monitors so you can see exactly what the processor has been doing. Think, for example, cache stores or um, TLB reloads and lots of really deep nitty gritty knowledge from the CPU. Um, it can also show you things like how much memory is being used and the BOGO op counter as well. And that shows you some, some bogus measure of throughput for each stressor. So that's a very quick overview. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So here's a very, let's get into details. Here's, here's a very simple example. The first example runs the CPU stressor. Now it has CPU one, which means just run one instance of the stressor. And the minus T option says run it for five minutes. So stress and T will just basically run the CPU stressor, which will exercise lots of different CPU um, operations such as floating point, integer maths, um, jumping around, cache, instruction cache usage and stuff. So it basically makes the CPU as toasty as possible and will run it for five minutes on one CPU. 
but we can do more than that. Um, the next example shows um, stress and G minus minus cash eight. So that runs eight instances of the cash stressor. And also can run the memory contention stressor, which will basically have, in this example, four M contend stressors, which will exercise reading and writing memory and trying to basically exercise the memory um, in a way which will be detrimental to the processor. So it's fighting over memory reads, memory writes in, in the same or different locations across cache and across memory. And this test, the minus T option says, run it for one hour. So you can see the T option, you can specify minutes, hours, you can specify days, or even years if, you, if you're that inclined, or, or seconds. So the T option allows you to specify the time and the number of um, stresses specifies how many instances to run. In the final example, um, we, we're running the virtual memory stressor and using the number zero says to stress and G run, well, find out how many CPUs there are on the system and then run the VM stressor on every CPU. And this is kind of handy if you don't know how many CPUs you've got or you can't be bothered to put them in, you know, the zero option will always pick up the number of available CPUs. So um, my laptop's got eight CPUs. So minus VM zero is equivalent to running minus VM eight. And there are other options as well. So each stressor might have extra options. So the VM stressor has an option to specify how much memory you, you can use. So for this, uh, this example, I'm using VM bytes 95%. So the stressor will look at how much memory is available and use 95% of that. Um, also, I'm enabling the verify option, and that tells the stressor to exercise memory and then read back the results to make sure there aren't any memory errors. Now, when you put the verify mode on, tests will run slower because verification takes a bit of an overhead. So if you're using benchmarking with BOGO ops, turn verify off and you'll get faster results than if you have verify on. So hopefully that gives you a quick overview of how to start different stresses and how you can run one or many stresses or you can mix and max stresses and also how stresses can have extra options to drive them or configure them in different ways. So can I have the next slide, please? Right, so um, as, as mentioned earlier, um, for the VM bytes option, I gave it a percentage, but you can also specify sizes in uh, megabytes or gigabytes or terabytes. So whenever there's a, um, an option to specify size, it will normally be the stressor name bytes or um, yeah, for example, VM will be VM bytes. And if you're stressing like the hard disk, then it's HCD bytes. And you can specify sizes in, in kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes or terabytes, depending on the suffix of the size. Or you can even put percentage as a percentage of the total resource. And um, again, with times, you can specify minutes, hours, days, years. Uh, for time, the default is in seconds. So you can specify like minus T30, that'd be 30 seconds, or minus T30S, that's equivalent of 30 seconds as well. You cannot specify fractions though. These are all integer values, I'm afraid. So maybe one day I'll, I'll address that and fix it properly, but currently all the sizes and times are in integer values. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of how to configure sizes and things. How is stress and G different from LTP? I'll answer that question at the end of the session, I think, if that's okay. Thanks for that question. Right, can I have the next slide, please? Right, so one of the strengths of stress and G is we, we can use concurrency to hammer a system. So as I said earlier, we can run multiple instances of a stressor and multiple instances of lots of stressors. And these stressors are being monitored by stress and G as they're running. So stress and G can tell if the um killer has killed a memory stressing instance and it will restart that stressor um, over and over if it gets oomed. Although one can over override that default by using the um, the unify option. 
uh, if I can remember, yeah, sorry, the Umable option. So the Umable option will tell a stressor, stress entity to allow stressors to fail if they're owned and never get respawned. But the default behavior is to continue to respawn and keep stressing. Now, some of these stressor instances themselves may fork off their own children. For example, a lot of the network stressors start up a client and server mode. So they themselves have their own children. And some stressors can use pthreads and multiple pthreads. So, you know, a stressor is not just one process, it could be one or more processes or one or more pthreads. And the idea of concurrency is really just to try and trigger soft or hard locks, uh, locking conditions, and places where the kernel can't handle um, concurrency correctly. And in the past, stress and has been quite useful at finding these types of conditions especially corner cases with race conditions where things aren't completing correctly. Okay, next slide, please. So I'll quickly give you a view of um, some of the stress cases we've got. So stress and G has been designed to st stress CPU caches. Um, so typically in modern processes, we have a level one cache, which might be a split data cache or instruction cache or a combined data and instruction cache, depending on the architecture. Nowadays, most processes have a level two cache and there might be even a last level cache, level three, or even a level four cache. And finally, we hit the actual memory, uh, the DRAM chips. So the whole idea of um, cache stressing is to put weight on the um, different levels of caches by fetching data, prefetching, using fencing operations, flushing, validating cache lines, and basically trying to hammer the adjacent cache lines to cause lots of havoc in the cache and also on the memory. So um, this is kind of useful with, um, with the development of processes and part of the work I've been doing at Intel is this kind of work where we have processes and we wanna make sure the cache is working correctly. Um, the other thing is, um, from cache stressing, we can actually um, badly modify the ca instruction cache. So when you do self-modifying code or instruction cache flushing or random branching, we can make the level one cache behavior um, be exercised in a stressful way. We can um, cause lots of um, cache misses, and this is kind of useful for testing as well. Otherwise, other places where we can stress the cache are doing streaming memory writes or randomized memory rewrites, and also doing um, exercising shared memory across multiple CPUs in symmetric multi-processing or even NUMA style architectures. So Stress and T has got quite a lot of tools for checking out to see if the cache is working correctly, especially if I, especially if you use the verify mode on these stressors, it will try and exercise and find weird corner cases where caches might be behaving incorrectly. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, I'll just quickly show you, here's examples of how to use um, some of the cache stressors. The first one uses the cache stressor across all CPUs, and it uses um, an option just to flush the cache. So basically the stressor is spinning around, flushing caches all the time and checking if that works correctly. Um, let's go through, um, you can add the, like the, uh, uh, the third, third example exercises the level one cache only. So it allocates a buffer exactly the same size as a level one cache and will keep on exercising memory, um, which will make the level one cache um, be hammered a lot. And there's a verify option there to make sure it's working correctly. And um, there's also a prefetch stressor, the bottom example. So you can, if you want to benchmark how fast um, prefetch reads are on the level three cache, the prefetch stressor with the metrics option allows you to benchmark how fast you can read from your level three cache. So I hope that gives some flavor. There are lots more um, stressors, but these are just a taste of some of the, some of the stressors just designed for CPU cache handling. Can I have the next slide, please? Right, now, system calls are really where um, Stress and G tries to work the kernel hard. Um, 
there are different ways of exercising system calls on the kernel. You can um, stress and G can call libc, and libc then exercise uh, calls the system call which goes to the kernel. So that's one way. So if you use say the select um, API, um, that's using libc, which then calls the select system call. There are other ways of exercising system calls as well. You can directly call them using syscall, or um, you can use a special bit of memory called the VDSO. Now the VDSO has functions in a shared page, which um, is shared between um, user space and the kernel. And it's a very fast way of calling a function which can read some kernel data and returning without actually jumping into kernel space, but it gives you kernel um, kind of system calls. So get time of day is implemented like that. So it's super fast, but doesn't actually cross the kernel boundary. So stress and G exercises the VDSO um, system calls. We also on x86, we use the x86 syscall instruction and also the x86 int um, syscall trap handler as well. So we're trying to exercise different ways of entering the kernel um, various different ways. And I think it's been about three years now I've been working on this and about 98% of all the system calls are now covered. I'm just missing some of the mount system calls which were added in a couple of years ago. I haven't quite got, got around to that yet. So the idea is basically cover as many of the system calls which are provided in Linux. And I'm also working on that for different operating systems as well. And the way we test these system calls is obviously we use valid ways of using it. So each system call has a valid use case. So stress and T tries to exercise all those different use cases. But also we've got ways of exercising invalid arguments. Um, so we use the system calls in just stupid ways, wrong arguments, uh, and, and ways which are kind of pathologically stupid, just to see if those trip kernel bugs. Now, this is not a repli replacement for um, things like syscaller, and syscaller is a fantastic way of um, fuzzing kernel interfaces. Stress and G is not intended to do that. Stress and G is just intended to use system calls, and with a large combination of system calls being used in lots of stresses, hopefully that forces out a different class of bugs. So if you're really interested in breaking system calls, use syscaller. Next slide, please. So here are some examples. Um, I've got a, stress, a stressor called sysinval, which just uses um, lots of different permutations of invalid arguments. Um, I've got a stressor which calls lots of different random system call numbers which are not valid. And um, for example, we found a bug on the RISC-V kernel where the boundary wasn't set correctly, so we're causing a cause kernel um, error with that. Um, as I said earlier, we've got the VDSO being tested, and also we can test um, x86 system calls. So there's a different you know, mix of ways of exercising system calls as illustrated there. Next slide, please. So other kernel interfaces, apart from system calls, are um, the dev, sys, and proc file systems and dev nodes. So these um, use the traditional Linux mindset of everything as a file. So um, for device entries and sysfs and procfs files, um, stress and g will iterate over all the ones it can find, and it'll try and open them, perform IARC tools or file controls on them. It'll try and mem map, do read and writes where appropriate, and basically exercise um, as many different ways as possible on these different files. The whole idea here is to use um, um, like sysfs and procfs in ways which maybe weren't designed just to try and catch bugs and shake out issues. And we've had some success with that in the past. For example, doing seek and reads at different offsets and moving around on a seek and read on a sysfs file. I think that triggered a bug and that got fixed. Um, and with device entries, um, stress and G will detect what type of device they are, such as block devices or character devices, and it'll try and de um, determine what type of device it might be as a subset of that. So it might be a CD-ROM device, and then it will exercise lots of IO controls on the CD-ROM and try and force out bugs. So it tries to be thorough, but there's still more work to be done there because um, 
device drivers are a huge part of the kernel and <laughs> there's a lot of work for to get full coverage um one other thing to say is sometimes when exercising these the kernel might might just um, break or maybe a device just hangs for a while so stress and cheese got intelligence to detect if opens get blocked and it will back off and not try that again if something's gone wrong so it tries to get its um session g tries to move forward if it gets stuck but sometimes kernels just break and stress and g will then eventually stop working if it can't move forward but it tries its very best to keep on working next slide please so here's some examples um we got stress and g exercising the device stressor on every cpu we have to run running this as root allows you to access more functionality from the device drivers uh, but it does come with its risks and the option k log check will check for any new messages appearing in the kernel log and it will report those to standard out when running stress ng that way you can see if the kernel panics or throws any weird warnings when exercising device drivers and the same kind of examples fathering on for sysfs and procfs so um, one difficulty is there are multiple devices and thousands of files in sysfs and procfs so if you run these stresses please run them for at least five minutes or maybe much longer depending on the speed of your machine just so that every um, file gets exercised in these pseudo file systems can i have the next slide please right um quickly moving on to the scheduler um, this is a very naive diagram on the left hand side, but basically um, there's the run queue and lots of stressors are queued up on different um, CPU threads. And one way of um, making sure things kind of work is to force context switching and changing um, affinity, moving stressors from one CPU to another and back again, um, causing um, reprioritization and changing um, niceness values and doing lots of evil things like thousands of forks and clones and then dying very quickly or hanging around to cause zombies um, thrashing the weight system call it's waiting for thousands of threads and um, migrating things across um, NUMA nodes and doing things like locking on resources and forcing priority inversion. So we really try and thrash a CPU scheduler and um, we can, with stress and G, we can cause ridiculously high load averages, which always interesting to see what happens when the system gets fully overloaded and um, you know, see if any soft locks occur or even hard locks in the kernel when the scheduler has a massive run queue. So that's the mindset behind that. Can we have the next slide, please? So again, here are some very quick examples. Um, the, the first one exercise the fork, v fork, clone, and daemon stresses. So that's an, um, multiple instances on all CPUs with lots of stresses running. If you run that, you'll watch your load average just crawl up to a stupid level. Um, we could do things like create zombies. So we can create processes which um, die, but wait a while for being reaped. Um, we can force heavy context switching with the switch stressor. And there's some other stretches that's stressors which also can force context switching, but here's a good example. And um, the HR timer stressor is really cool because it, with the HR timer adjust option, it will try and figure out what's the shortest timer interval to schedule to create the most timer interrupts. And when you run this across um, multiple CPUs on a, on a system with lots of CPUs, it's really amusing to see how many thousands of or millions of interrupts you can generate on the high resolution timers. And this is um, one way of exercising a system to see if you cause any problems with that. Uh, next, uh, next page, please. So there are too many really to, uh, to um, list here, but um, to give you a flavor of the different types of scheduler stressors, is a um, the definitive list at present. I uh, just want to pick out a few. Um, there's one. Uh, where is it? There's um, a soft lockup stressor which was designed to cause soft lockups. Um, 
and there's another stressor where is it called um sink load this one creates a load which um scales across all cpus and then in synchronization it will stop the load for duration and then it will in another um synchronized event in time it will start the load so it will start and stop load across the whole seat across all the cpus and that's kind of useful for um seeing how um, frequency scaling occurs and um seeing how well the system can spin up and then shut down when you've got loads peaking and spiking very frequently <clears throat> but there are far too many examples here to give you you know work example on each so please refer to the stress and d manual but i just want to give you a, a flavor of there are lots of different ways of stressing this um scheduler with stress ng next slide please so um, network stressing, this is um, still a work in progress. Um, I've got a partial coverage of um, the network stack with stress ng. And essentially most of the stressors, um, a stressor such as UDP or TCP or DCP, DCTP or SCTP stressors start a client and server. They talk to the kernel um, and basically use the loopback network to, um, device driver to send messages to and from <clears throat> the client and server. So it's all within the system. <clears throat> Packets never go outside the system, so you can't do denial of service attacks on other hosts. So that's the idea there. Um, so there are quite a, a, a range of stresses for that. We also do iComp and ping flooding on the local host. And stress and also supports um, raw socket and raw UDP client server models. I try and exercise as well all the IO controls and set sock options where possible. And stress and G network stressors can use the different ways of sending and receiving messages using the send and write family, and conversely, the receive and read family of system calls to send and receive data over a socket or over the network. Currently, we support IPv4, IPv6, and also Unix domain sockets. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some examples. Um, the first one is UDP stressor on all CPUs. We also enable UDP light and we specify IPv6 for the UDP domain. So as you can see, the options are there are quite flexible and allows you to target different use cases. Um, oh, I've got some, got some background noise. Thank you. Right. Um, like for TCP socket set stresses, um, there's a socket example there, and where possible, it, you can use zero copy for faster um, packet transmission to, into the kernel space. And um, the SOC options there says you send message to send a packet or send a send data. Um, uh, the next example is a SOC many stressor, and this one's useful because it it runs 200 instances of the SOC mini stressor and the SOC mini stressor itself will open up thousands of socket connections to itself. Um, so it will basically thrash the mas machine with hopefully tens or even hundreds of thousands of open sockets. And we can point this to um, a, a specific interface as well. So um, that's another socket option. So all the, all the all the network stressor stressors have an IF option to specify the network interface to be used. The default is the loopback, but you can specify other network devices. And again, you can mix different stressors. So the bottom example shows TCCP and SCTP protocols being used, with eight and four stressors being run in that example. So mix and max hammer of the network. You can also specify each, each um, stressor allows you to specify the port being used as well. So if you want, you can move ports around and target the same port with lots of different stressors as well, just to cause havoc. So have fun with that. Uh, next slide, please. So there are lots of different types of um, network specific stressors. Um, I mentioned a few earlier, but there's the whole list of stresses which could be used for the network. I also exercise the Linux Netlink um, interfaces. So that's the, the PROC and TASK Netlink, Netlink interfaces. 
Um, I also do a bit of network device stressing on the interface there. And a curious one is the um, crypto AFALG protocol. Um, so you can actually talk to the crypto engines in the kernel over a socket. So that's the AFALG stressor. So it's not really a network stressor, but it uses um, a network socket. So I just included it in this list. So yeah, there's a bit of coverage, but ultimately I would like to cover more protocols. So if anyone is a real kernel, uh, kernel and Linux networking guru, please consider adding more stress tests for me where there are gaps, because I'd love to see that. Right, next next slide, please. So I'm, I hope I'm not boring everyone with all these examples, but I'll go on to now the virtual memory stressor. So um, in, in on the real physical hardware, we have physical pages, but Linux allows um, those pages to be virtualized. So each, um, each process, when it uses a page, is using a mapping on from a physical page. Um, now, Stress and G tries very hard to exercise memory mapping and virtual memory space, memory space with lots of devious stresses. So the idea here is to really see all the different ways we can memory map pages, change attributes, map it to files or physically back to memory, change attributes with um, this way stuff is shared, change protection bits, um, exercise page sharing across processes, and basically force page eviction and swapping and all sorts of havoc like that. So we're trying to basically exercise the memory subsystem in the kernel and try and cause problems. Um, things like um, pages, when you've got tens of thousands or maybe millions mapped, um, Stress and G can exercise page um, traversal, and that exercise is walking over different pages and causing translation look aside buffer refreshes and basically hammering the virtual memory subsystem as much as we can. Uh, next slide, please. So I might have showed earlier the VM stressor. Um, the VM stressor is an interesting one because it contains lots of um, methods for stressing memory. So it's a good one. If you want to have a system and you want to make sure um, memory is working correctly and you're not getting bit rot, um, the VM stressor is, is a good first try. Um, in the first example, I'm using eight stressors on nearly all the available virtual memory um, the VM populate basically says when, when a page is allocated, um, back it with physical memory immediately it's mapped. And the verify option says um, when exercising each page with a test, make sure the bits are all correct and we haven't had any bit errors during the testing. Um, now, uh, the second example shows 32 gig of memory being exercised by the VM stressor. And I introduce here the VM method option. And the VM method option allows one to specify the different ways of exercising the memory. And there are lots of these options, and I'll describe them at a later point. But for this example, we're using a bit flip stressor, and that goes through every single bit in each byte in each page of the 32 gigs, and will flip them from zero to one, one by one, and then verify those bit flips work correctly. Um, but the VM method has, as I say, lots of different ways of hammering memory in lots of different ways from rotating or shifting, XORing, popping in different patterns, walking over um, cache boundaries, and all sorts of weird and wonderful ways to try and cause memory bit corruption. Um, the next example shows um, an abuse of the virtual memory system by running the break and stack stresses. So if you're not clued up about how the break work, um, the break um, or S break system calls are, are they used for using uh, allocating memory on the heap. So the break stressor is equivalent to using like malloc, allocating lots and lots of memory. And this will cause paging. And then hopefully um, the kernel might kill the process using the im killer once it's um, used too much memory because the way Linux is um killer and overcommit works. The stack stressor um, just keeps on pushing data onto the stack and tries to 
run out of memory through um, abusing the stack. Um, so it's basically, if you've got lots of swap, this stressor will take a long time to complete because swap is slow, but eventually it will get to the point where there's no more memory left and the human killer will kill the stressor. And stress NG will restart that process. It will just keep on stressing until you stop it. The final example shows how to generate minor and major page faults. Um, um, it's an exercise to the reader, I think, to explain how major and major, minor page faults works. But just, just to let you know, if you want to create millions of page faults, use this stress option. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's some other examples. You can do things like um, ran, run random memory advice hints on lots of pages. So that's the M advice stressor. Um, if you look at the M advice system call, you'll see there's lots of different ways of giving hints to the uh, virtual memory subsystem to say things like, um, I want this page, or I don't want this page anymore, or please page this in and back it with physical memory. So there's lots of different ways the M advice stressor exercises lots of different pages. Um, the next example um, uses the memlock API to try and lock pages into memory so they don't get swapped out. Um, if you run this stress with thousands of instances, it will try and, as root, it will try and lock as many pages into memory. And then you get weird bugs occurring because other processes can't get that, well, get swapped out and maybe you'll see demons crash and so forth. So it's a good way of allocating lots of pages and causing a bit of havoc. Um, other ways you can um, exercise memory. Uh, the next example uses the memory map stressor and it backs the memory map pages with a file and it's a four gigabytes worth of allocation. So that's a simple example there. And the remap stressor does memory mapping and remapping. So again, we exercise the memory remap API. So it's all very simple stuff, very focused, um, but you know we need to test the kernel APIs and abuse them and see if any bugs pop out. Next slide, please. Right, how are we doing top? Yeah, memory, there are lots of different, different ways of exercising with stress and G. There are things like B search and heap sort and H search, which um, exercise memory doing searching and sorting algorithms. Um, the list is endless. So I, I advise people to look at the manual page or the documentation because there are a lot of stresses here, but stress and T is designed primarily to hammer memory and cause processes to fail or the kernel to run out of memory and cause lockups. Next slide, please. Um, Colin, hmm. I have a couple of uh, uh, questions in the Q&A yeah. and then also I have some questions of my sure. own. I was wondering if it might be a good break for you. Yeah, because I'm doing a lot. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I can skip through here. Maybe we can go through. So let's ask them some questions. So that's a good oh, idea. OK. So would you like to, uh, uh, is this a good time to answer some of the questions? Yeah, the yeah. So okay. yeah. So the first question was, how is stress and G different from LTP? So LTP um, is a really excellent source of regression tests. And um, LTP has lots and lots of um, very focused small subtests. Stress and G is different because it allows you to mix and max, mix and match lots of stress cases across lots of CPUs. And um, so in this case, you know, you, you could do more focused testing with a good mix. Um, stress and G also has um, some options to doing benchmarking and profiling and seeing how the kernel is running with like perf monitors. So in a way. Stress and G is different from LTP in that respect, but I can't say much more because my knowledge of LTP is a little bit weak, but LTP is very focused on micro tests. Stress and G has stressors which have a bit more functionality built in. I could be wrong on that. So, so uh, <laughs> caveat emptor, <laughs> please bear with me if I'm wrong on that. Do we have, what's the next question? Do we have any support to stress encrypted file systems? Um, well, the, we don't use, um, well, Stress and G exercises file systems. So once you mount an encrypted file system, you can run Stress and G and target that mounted file system. But there aren't any specific um, crypto, encrypt style APIs being used. 
So um, the answer is nothing special is being done. It's very much like how FIO would be used to stress test the file system. Um, Rob Berto has asked a good question uh, about practices to test VM hypervisors. Um, yeah, so um, it really depends what you want to look at. Um, I suspect with hypervisors, you want to make sure that um, um, you know, you're not running out of memory, you can do memory contention. Stress and G has, as I say, lots of memory stresses. You might also like to see if things like noisy neighbor problems occur. So one thing with virtualization is you can have um, multiple um, virtual machines running on the same hardware. And Stress and G has some devious stresses, for example, the lock bus stressor, which will exercise um, various instructions which do locking across page boundaries and cache boundaries and really horrible things like that, which can actually affect um, neighboring virtual machines. So that's a good thing to test. Um, stress and G also has um, different memory stresses like memrate, and that allows you to benchmark your memory on your hypervisor. Um, and maybe loading um, your hypervisor um, with lots of CPU load is useful just to see how well it's respond in, in, in cranking up to full speed and not. So um, I think the question really Roboto can be best answered if, if you look for the stress and team manual and, and consult all the different stress cases and see if they're um, useful for your use case. Because um, it's difficult to say really, because I don't know how you'd be using your hypervisor. Ho hopefully that helps a bit. Um, any further questions or I, 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 I yeah. have a few questions mm. um, myself uh, so when you you talked about exercising cache um, mm. um, back on you know a few slides ago what does exercising mean in the context of cache and what actions what kind of tests do you do what does it mean oh okay exercise? so so um if you imagine the cache is broken up into um small cache line um blobs uh, you know normally on an x86 we're talking about 64 byte chunks stress and g will try and walk over those and for example flush them out and then um you know there are lots of different options but one of them is you know walk through the cache and try and on multiple cpus flush and maybe prefetch and mix those and then test if the memory is coherent as it should be um, for example if you're sharing a page a memory across multiple stresses Stress and G will write to those different um, bits of memory. And hopefully, if the um, cache man management's working correctly, you won't see the wrong contents appear. It should be all coherent across all the processes. Um, so there's like testing like that. Um, um, with some of the stresses, it's basically can we just exercise the, the cache in very bizarre mixes in ways which you probably wouldn't do in real life, but it's useful to kind of um, thrash the cache with um, reloading and stuff just to see how well it performs. And so, some of the stresses, for example, the stream memory stressor will read all the way through memory. And when you enable the perf option, you can see how well it's doing in, in cache misses and prefetching. So you can look at kernel per, uh, CPU perf monitors just to see how well the cache is behaving to see if it's working as you expect or not. So obviously you need some in-depth knowledge about how cache works mm -hmm. and, and how perf monitors work. But the, hopefully the mix of stresses you can use allow you to kind of um, construct different stress scenarios to exercise the cache the ways you want. So it looks like you are uh, exercising cache coherency, integrity, mm -hmm. and performance aspects, all of yes. that. Yeah. So this is uh, x86 only, or is this other? Well, that yeah, pr well? Pr predominantly um, x86, but there are other there are other architectures like ARM. I've got some of these features working, and um, there's some other architectures I can't remember now where there are some kind of flushing options. So um, where possible, if the process supports it, I will try and implement the more complex cache behavior. Um, um, I've got a question here. How can you make sure stress cache, different stress cache, and line type cache? Um, I'm afraid I don't understand that question actually. Um, 
I don't understand what nine type means there. So while uh, um, maybe that could be clarified. <laughs> yes, while uh, while Yang is uh, going to clarify, I have another question. You mm -hmm. mentioned on CISFS when you were talking about CISFS and PROCFS and that coverage, and you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, give enough time. Um, mm. What is in your experience in ideal time, say in a QMU versus um, a desktop, for example? Um, well, I kind of experience seems to tell me that unless, well, normally 10 minutes is sufficient, um, but it really depends if, if you've got a device, which is like, you know, if you've got a CD-ROM attached, and the, the stressor exercises the CD-ROM, you know, sometimes it takes a while to open the device because there's a CD in there and, you know, and so it really depends on what devices are, are attached mm -hmm. and um, how slow some of the devices are to start and stop or for their timeouts and so forth. So um, I, typically I do about 10 minutes worth of testing with as many CPUs as possible to cause as much racing havoc um each, each of those stresses by the way files off lots of p threads so there's lots of concurrency working at the p thread level and also at the um processor a uh, process level on lots of different cpus so that's why i get quite good coverage results um with this kind of parallelization which stress and g is using but it's also worthwhile running it for say 10 minutes to get as much coverage as possible Okay, the question is non-inclusive and non-exclusive policy cache. Um, <laughs> um, I still don't understand that, so excuse my naivety and not understanding the, the cache question. Um, I will look that up and get back to you. I think that's probably the best thing. Um, short, um, if, if I can't pronounce the time, Shahu, Shahu can reach out to me and send me an email, I will look into that and answer that question, because at the moment, I don't know how to answer it. Great. Um, thank you. And I have, uh, sorry, I have a couple more questions. Mm. I've been writing down questions as yeah. during the presentation because I was kind of manning the, um, or advancing the slides. Mm. Um, what is load in your sync load option? You mentioned load. Oh, okay, sync load. What does so, it mean? Okay, so sync load will basically um, do some very simple busy spins on the CPU, just doing some simple math operations and things like that. So it's nothing, nothing like rocket science there. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea there is just to keep the CPU busy, CPUs busy um, across the whole set of CPUs for a determined amount of time, and then to stop and go idle. And then again, do like very simple busy maths in a spin loop and just keep on iterating over that. And the sync load stressor allows you to specify the time when it's idle and busy. So you can specify it in like terms of nanoseconds or, you know, you can scale it up to seconds or so and just twiddle around with those options just to try and um, force, you know, CPU busyness and unbusy cycling. Okay, so that is across all CPUs. You could specify uh, multiple CPUs and say, hey, kind of alternate between idle and... Yeah, and the whole, the whole idea is, is basically do it everything in sync um and that that should exercise like the x86 um, um um cpu scaling you know, dropping up in different c states p states um so that's the purpose so you know the reason why you can change the the duration is then you can see if it if i can drop into the leap am i actually dropping into the deepest c state across all mm -hmm. cpus or not so that's the kind of mindset there. Plus also it's useful if you want to um, run a, say a laptop, like busy, not busy, busy, not busy, and see how the fan response responds because the, you know, the temperature might rise up and the fan might, might be cycling or not cycling. So it's just another, it's another, another way of loading CPUs basically. So would you also put in, for this kind of testing, do you also take into account which ACPI, ACPI mode that CPUs might be in, like a performance mode or, um, uh, you know, uh, normal mode kind of things, low power consumption type modes, or do you not worry about I, that? I, I don't worry about that. That's <laughs> um, really how the user wants to configure their system. And I, I try and keep it as um, policy free as possible. It's, okay. it's it, you basically set your system up and see, see how you want to use it in a particular mode, then run stress in G. Uh, Looks like we have a question in the Q&A okay. and then also one person has their hand up. All right, how, how can I come with a good baseline 
benchmark values. Yeah, so this is the interesting thing of, um, yeah, so if you're using the uh, metrics, the um, stress energy contains this notion of BOGO ops, which is how many times it's spun round a busy stressing loop. Um, the, the baseline is interesting. Um, what you should always do when comparing systems with stress energy is number one, don't compare, compare different systems with different versions of stress NG. So ensure you build stress NG or install one version of stress NG when you're testing it across systems to benchmark think systems. Number two, if you're building it from source, make sure you're using the same compiler version. And um, the reason is um, stress NG will try and use more advanced optimization features inside the compiler when available. So when benchmarking, if you compile the same version of stress and G with older or newer compilers, you might get different metrics coming out. Um, so benchmarking, um, one thing to bear in mind is the BOGO ops uh, measurement does, can, does suffer from jitter if you don't run the stress test long enough. And another thing is some stress tests uh, work very well in providing reliable benchmarks, others don't. And it's re the reason is just the, the behavior of the system. For example, if you're doing um, lots of random IO seeks on a hard disk, you'll get different metrics than if you're doing something like measuring CPU operations, because the CPU operations is consistent, whereas on the hard disk, you're, you're, you're working with real physical hardware, which can vary in performance. So I don't think I've answered that question well, but there's some things you need to be aware of is, run always with the same stress and G, build it with the same compiler, then you can compare apples with apples rather than apples than pears. So, um, and, and running a good baseline, it's always good to run the benchmarks on all CPUs rather than just one CPU. You will notice different behavior as stuff scales up. So benchmarks are reliable if you run them across all the CPUs, that way you know you've got a fully loaded system and you've got a fairly representative idea of how your system's behaving. So I hope that answers the news question. Um, oh, good. Okay, that's good. Somebody okay. The hand up. Do you, is that? Oh, I can't see. Have? Oh, yeah. Sorry, chat. Is that under chat in there? Hi. Yeah, I see. Okay. Um, so, can you, uh, yeah, I, sorry for the early question about uh, inclusive and uh, exclusive uh, catch. So what I mean is, because you know some of the level of the catch in the might inclusive of the lower level, so that means uh, when you, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay, I got it. Yeah. So um, the cache, the, the stresses are particularly naive. So if you say I want to stress the level one cache, basically stress and G will allocate a buffer exactly the size of the level one cache, and then exclusively exercise that. So you will get probably leakage down. You know, so the stuff gets flushed out from from beforehand. Um, but if you're spinning on that one blob of memory, which fits inside, say, the level one cache, then hopefully that will keep it active in that as that working set. Um, so I don't have any smarts to say exclude, you know, stuff from level two or level three or, or DRAM. It's, it's not that smart. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> well, Okay, that um, I think wraps up questions and then we can move back to the yeah. presentation. Let me take you back and then- I'll, I'll, zip, I'll zip through because um, I, I think I've got lots of examples. So maybe people can look at the slides later for more worked examples. I think I've got quite a bit of content to go through. So let's, let's go on to the next slide and we'll zip okay. through. Okay. Um, so yeah, so as I say, lots of examples here. Um, thermal overrun was really what, what strategy was designed originally to do, and strategy has lots of different ways of exercising the CPU. So the CPU stressor has over 80 individual stressor methods, and they exercise all types of compute, from floating point vector, loading, storing, trig functions, and then it's got algorithms which are used widely in industries such as Fourier transforms, cyclic computations, IPv4 checksums. There's also compression and packing and all sorts of things being used there. So I think stress and G at this point is fairly representative of ways to make your CPUs hot and, and, and exercise them. Now, the thing to be aware of is if you find a stress test which works really well for your CPU, if you upgrade your CPU, it might be a different set of stresses which make it hit a thermal overrun. That's because the way 
um, the microarchitecture changes over time. So, um, you know, always be aware that what is today's good test might not be so in two years time. And it also it's per architecture specific. So something on x86 makes it really hot, might not be the same for a uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I won't go through them all, but here are some more examples of ways of stressing stuff. The thing to notice here is there's a TZ option and that allows you to um, dump out the state of the thermal zones. So you run your stress test for five minutes and the thermal zones, um, the temperatures for every thermal zone on your computer will be dumped out and you can see how hot it's getting. Um, and third example down, the int 128 decimal 32 is a really good um, CPU stress test for x86 systems. It tests 84 bit, sorry, 128 bit integer maths and um, decimal 32 bit maths. And for some reason, this seems to make modern x86 is quite toasty hot. So that's something bearing in mind. And the matrix stressor is useful because it does the compute and cache bound make, um, loaders and stores. So the cache gets hot and the compute part of the CPU gets warm as well. So those, those particular tests, which are illustrated here, seem to produce the most heat, but your mileage may vary, but vary on different um, systems. Next slide, please. So as I said, the minus TZ option will dump out thermal zone temperatures in centigrade in Kelvin. So, you know, it's kind of useful just to see how my laptop gets hot here. And that's after changing the thermal paste. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, very simple example, nice data coming out of it. Ne next slide, please. Um, some other um, compute options is JPEG compression, it produces a series of different types of images to compress with JPEG stressor. We've got a Zeblid compression. We've got vector maths and wide vector operations. Um, these are only really supported in modern x86 processors or architectures which support, support the GCC um, vector maths. I'm using um, the GCC target clones um, attribute to try and map, generate code which matches new versions of CPUs as well. So if you've got the latest and greatest x86 system, then hopefully GCC will produce code which is quite efficient or relatively efficient for your target processor. And this is determined at runtime. So when the stress test starts up, it will say, oh, you've got all these fancy wide vector operations. Let's use that bit of code. Um, another, another one to um, look at are hashing functions. Uh, stress and G has, oh, I think, at least 20 hashing functions, and they're good for stressing shifting, multiplying, and memory and cache activity. So those kind of make the system a bit warm as well. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, just to say again, stress and CPU stressor is very wide and rich. So look at the um, which option, that CPU method which, and that will show you all the different stressors, stress methods in the stress and CPU stressor. Uh, next slide. Um, storage, now some folk asked earlier about EcryptFS, EcryptFS. Stress and G can um, exercise a lot of the, um, well, all of the um, file system, system calls, so reading, writing, seeking, um, direct IO, async IO, um, it exercises IOU ring, um, syncing data, um, um, creating holes, punching holes in files. And I also exercise a lot of file-based IOC tools as well. Um, there's locking as well, all the different locking APIs, which Linux has way too many. Um, so you, know, you can exercise that on the file system. So point it to your favorite file system, be it EcryptFS, CXD4, XFS, ButterFS, whatever, or ZFS, for example, and then um, run the stress test on that. And um, we've also got the ability of stress and to actually exercise the raw device by doing lots of random read, read patterns and interesting read patterns, which is kind of fun on a traditional old hard disk because you can move the head back and forth and exercise it. Now, Stress and G is not really a benchmarking tool replacement for FIO. If you want to do serious file system work, I use FIO, but you know, Stress and G still got the ability to test things if you want, but I recommend FIO. It's the most excellent tool. Next slide, please. Um, 
So one feature I put into stress and is to actually check the drive smart stats and each, most modern drives have smart enabled and they can tell you if your drive is going to fail or how hot it's getting and other interesting features like that. So the top example runs a mix of IO patterns, enables the smart um, um, monitoring and says, I wanna test that file system with 10% of um, free space on that file system. Leave that running for a while, stop the test and the smart data will dump out. And now I've used this before on a drive and detected um, it was having lots of seek errors and one or two read problems. And so it's kind of useful as a way of exercising a drive to see if it's gonna fail or not. Um, one other option I'd like to draw your attention to is the temp path option. So that's in the third example down. So you can specify where stress and G will create its temporary files for the file system stressing. Stress and G will generally, well, will use the current directory you're running from as the default place to put its temporary files, but the temp path allows you to overwrite that. And that way you can specify lots of different mount points where file, other file systems are mounted. So I think that's a kind of a quick and quick and easy uh, example there. As I say, some more examples you can look at there or read the documentation. Uh, next slide, please. And as I say, there are lots of different file system stresses which test different system calls and ways of creating directories and populating directories and locking and so forth. So uh, yeah, um, some of those examples are at the bottom. I've got lots of different file system exercises being run all at the same time, um, just to show how you can mix and match different file system stressing capabilities with stress ng. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So here's an example of Minix being broken, just to show how portable stress ng is. It builds cleanly on Minix and it breaks the virtual file system. Oh dear, yes. Well, there we go. Next slide, please. Um, quickly, uh, just to say that stress and G can also exercise branch prediction. One of the stresses um, has a horrible mix of um, labels to jump to. So it uses um, a go to, to a, indirectly to a label and a little random number generator, which produces very difficult, hard to predict branching. And this causes lots of branch prediction miss rates. So that's a kind of nice little exercise just to see how good um, your processor is at doing branch prediction. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example using the branch stressor with a perf. And you can see the perf monitor stats being dumped out after a minute. And um, you can see that it's doing 0 0.31 billion branch instructions per second, of which uh, 0.29 billion a second of branch misses. So that's working out to be nearly 94% branch prediction misses. So that's how evil the branch stressor is. It, it really does make your branch prediction logic work hard and get it wrong. So, and there's another stressor I've written called the go-to stressor, which does forward and backwards branching. And um, it pushes so many into, um, into, it does so many of them that it actually run the your processor will run out of branch prediction logic so that's another way of making branch prediction work hard uh next slide please um quickly just to say that there are ways of exercising locking primitives so there's um the p thread mutex um a few tech system calls um some old ancient ways of doing locking using the Peterson and Decker algorithms, and that's just using shared memory and no kernel interfaces. Th those Peterson and Decker stressors are really useful for systems where you've got um, shared memory and you wanna make sure that the cache coherency is working correctly on, on an SMP or NUMA based system. And finally, um, atomic locking. And basically we've just got lots of x86 lock instructions other architectures it's implemented differently. So it's a really good way of, you know, literally every instruction is a locking instruction and um, it tries to do it across boundaries and all sorts of evil things like that just to make things difficult for the processor. Next slide, please. Um, so 
um, the, here's an example of exercising memory bandwidth. Um, this is the stream stressor, which is modeled on the streams, the de facto stream benchmark tool, but it behaves differently. It also allows lots of different levels of indirection to handle multiple pointer dereferences. So it's not exactly the same as the stream benchmark um, stress case, but it's useful for seeing the type of memory rates you can get from doing reads and writes and how much compute you can get while doing streaming operations. So it's a kind of a useful metric of compute and read so you can benchmark systems. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the next slide shows you the, this current one shows you the mem rate stressor. And this will do writes and reads of various sizes. On x86 systems, it will use non-temporal writes where possible. And that's basically where you bypass the cache and write directly to memory. Um, so you can get very good write performance with that. And there's also a prefetch read as well um, for x86 and systems which handle prefetching. So you know, this is a good benchmark if you want to just kind of get an idea of streaming write or read performance on your system. Uh, it's not really um, going to do any verification. It's just a throughput kind of benchmark. Next slide, please. Um, it, our interprocess communication, we use um, semaphores, message queues, and pipes. So those are pretty standard. So I won't go into that much more, but beware that, you know, stress and she can stress it. Next slide, please. Right, so now into how do I write stress and G? Well, apart from writing a stress test and having a guess how it works, I also use a GCUV instrumentation in the kernel. So I build a kernel with GCUV enabled. I install that kernel. Then I run um, a script called kernel coverage, which is in the stress and G repository. And this takes about 12 or 15 hours to run. At the end of the run, um, I run LCOV, and that generates HTML web pages which show every slide in the kernel which has been exercised or not exercised by StressNG. I then look at each stress care test and see where coverage is hitting and also missing. And then I try and devise new stress cases to exercise the bits which are missing. And basically I keep on repeating that, rinse and repeat, and try and add more features for each release, exercising more parts of the kernel. So if you've never seen um, LCOV output, Let's look at the next slide and I'll show you what we see. So next slide, please. So here's um, an example of the file system directory in the kernel. And you can see um, the coverage for each individual source file. And you can see um, how the coverage works in percentage of coverage and the number of lines in each file. So you can see I'm getting quite good coverage on some files, some parts of the system, whereas others like bin format misc, I'm not really exercising that at all. So there's hardly any coverage. Um, this can, the next slide will show you an individual source file in the kernel. So here we go, here's fs um, fcontrol.c. And there's one particular part of a case statement. So this particular command f get owner UIDs is not being exercised by stress and G for some reason. Now that could be because I haven't implemented it, or it could be because that um, that hash to find isn't in my libc implementation at the moment, or it may be my stress test is, is broken and not testing it correctly. But at least one can see by looking at the coverage that I'm not exercising it, so that needs to be addressed. So this is the kind of exercise I do. I after each well before each release, I run run this kind of coverage check that I'm getting better coverage from the previous version I released, make sure there are no regressions, and also identify areas where I can improve stress in G. It's very tedious, it's painstaking, but it does guarantee I get good coverage. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, one of the features of um, stress and G is micro benchmarking, and the, the BOGO op is a bogus measurement of operations per second. Remember, it's bogus. It's totally bogus. It doesn't mean anything apart from how many times a stress test is iterated on a loop. Um, as mentioned earlier, it can jitter a lot. Some stress tests are better than others, like compute bound ones have little jitter, but maybe IO based ones or ones where maybe the kernel is doing some other activity in the background 
it might get jitter. So bear, bear that in mind. I've also mentioned that new releases of strategy have optimizations, new, feature, new features, bug fixes, and so forth. So performance on the BOGO ops may and will change. So don't compare metrics from different versions of stress and teeth against each other. Make sure you build it with the same compiler. That is something you need to remember. And the BOGO ops are not gospel truth. This is not a true benchmarking system, but it's something to give you a feel a good kind of indication with a few percent of sloppage, you know, so it's jittery, it's sloppy, it's not perfect, but it's a good way of getting an idea of how well your system's performing. Um, like benchmarking is really hard to do, it's really hard to get right, so treat this uh, out with caution. The metrics option shows you the BOGO ops rates, and there's also a times option which shows you how much CPU time and system time user space time has been used for each stress test. And the example at the below, I'm running the CPU stressor and I'm saying do 10,000 BOGO ops and stop after that. So you can basically specify how many iterations you want to run rather than just specifying the time to run. Next slide, please. I think we're running out of time. So here's an example of the matrix stressor being run um, and the type of output you get. Notice that the first one I'm running with one CPU, the bottom one I'm running with eight. The number of BOGO ops from the first one, one is not eight times improved on the, on the one with eight CPUs, just because the way things scale and we're using threads and you don't get a one-to-one -one, you know, a, a one -one improvement as you increase the number of CPUs. But that gives you a flavor of how the metrics work and the type of BOGO ops stats you get. So you've got stuff like the real time, is the uh, war clock time, and then you've got user and system time in BOGO ops a second. So there are different ways of measuring throughput based on how long it's run or how much CP it's used for different parts of the user space or kernel combined. I hope that makes sense. If not, ask me later, and I'm very happy to clarify that. Quickly moving on to the final few slides. It's a bit of a marathon this. So um, here we go. Is this, um, Perf, I've mentioned this before, so I won't elaborate, but here's an example of the stream stressor with perf options. And you can see how many cache misses I'm getting, um, level one, level two, and TLB, that's misses and stuff. So perf is great for seeing how the system runs. You know, think of a stressor, run it, get perf output, and see how that changes on your system or to see where the hotspots are. So that's kind of useful. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, the other thing you can do while running a stress test, you can use like VM stat, thermal stat, or IO stat options to get more data out of stress and G while it's running. So the bottom example, we're running IO stat every five seconds, and that will show you how many reads and writes are occurring every five seconds, and um, the actual data, the amount of data being read and written as well. So that's IOSTAT. VM stat is very much like the VM stat tool, gives you information about CPU utilization. And thermal stat gives you some um, statistics of the how hot your CPU is getting. So mm -hmm. that's kind of useful to have. And you can run all those three in parallel. So you can VM stat, thermal stat, and IOSTAT all running at the same time, if you so like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to mention that you stresses are all gathered together in things called classes. So if you want to run like all the file system tests together, you can use the class option. So for this example shows you I'm running the file system class. I'm going to run them sequentially on eight CPUs and each stressor, file system stressor is going to be run for one minute. So you can kick that off and come back in an hour or so after it's walked through every file system stress test. So this, you know, it's just a useful way of collecting stresses up in, in, in a group of very similarly designed stress tests. Um, I don't use it that much, but some folk do. It's a couple of questions, Carl. Mm. Um, one is, uh, so this is, would be, would you, would you say running um, all these classes say, you know, putting in a shell script, would that exercise uh, the kernel? 
um, yeah while. yeah so if you did stress um well actually you could if you want to just do all the stresses you could just run stress ng minus seek eight minus t one minute and then mm -hmm. stress ng will work through every single of the 280 stresses for one minute each on all the cpus or eight cpus here but the class option allows you to say actually i want to just exercise all the stresses which exercise interrupts so you could do class interrupts or mm -hmm. you could say i want to do all memory specific ones so it'd be class memory and all this all you know all the memory type um stresses will run so it's just a way of bundling them together and kicking it off and running it for a while and then coming back to see how it's worked <laughs> so one question i have is as we were hmm. talking about earlier um about um LCAL and that's cool by the way how you determine uh if you need to make improvements to stress ng hmm. uh, to keep up with the kernel how often do you find yourself um uh, making changes to stress ng to keep up with the kernel features and then also uh, yeah. how extensive is that work you find yourself so so it's actually um i mean i've lost a lot of stress ng i've developed in my spare time so i i keep i as as, as as i work on the kernel quite a lot i keep track of what's going into linux next and what linus is actually pulling in for the next kernel and i also look at <laughs> things like Linux newbies, which has a list of all the features going into the kernel. So I try and keep an eye, of, eye on what uh, new system calls and maybe extra flag options and IOP calls and things are being added to the kernel. Mm -hmm. And then um, I build a kernel, the latest kernel, run the current stress test on it, and then eyeball those areas just to see, you know, just to verify that I'm not actually exercising them. <laughs> and then I'll write the stress test. So it's it's it takes it takes a bit of time. Um, so yeah um i must admit i do a release normally of stress and g once a month so i do the coverage at least once because i do it um around the release time um but and then using that coverage data i then write down a roadmap of extra things i want to put in for the next release so that's generally how i drive it um it's rather ad hoc work it's kind of spare time stuff i do in the evenings or the weekend so Happy it's it's kind of boring <laughs> it's really it's it's, it's mind mind-blowingly boring but i'd like to do it because i like to kind of add more features in so, so we have a question looks like mm. uh, from paul mm -hmm. um, in the q a box oh yeah uh let me find that uh what's been the taste of grand benefit stress and g okay so um the greatest benefit is really um you know, for example, the um, when when I was working with Ubuntu, in Ubuntu, we were bringing up the um, Risk Five um, platform. So we had a couple of um, development platforms, and we were working closely with a the vendor there. And we, they were running Stress NG, and we were running Stress NG, and we were finding all sorts of um, features just because of the new architecture, um, the problems with the system call interface, for example, and the way stuff was not being mapped correctly, we were causing um, panics when exercising the virtual memory subsystem in weird ways. So, you know, it's great for when you're doing new bring up of new platforms. Um, it's also really good when new features of the kernel arrive, you enable them. It's good just to kind of thrash it with stress ng just to see if it behaves correctly. So I think that's the benefit. Stress ng's found 45 or so kernel bugs, and they're not just Linux ones, they're ones based, you know, on, on different kernels as well. So I kind of think new architectures, new kernels, it's very useful to run stress ng. New features, it's good to exercise it. And missing capabilities. Well, I did, I was going to say that this GPU stressing is not used, uh, it's not implemented. But this very week, some very kind folk at Red Hat have sent me a patch which is in review, which stresses the GPU. So that's kind of answering that. But I do feel like the network side of things could be improved. Um, and other shortcomings is it's not good as tools like Syscall, Syscaller which is really developed to exercise system calls and does that really well. Stress NG is not like that. So, um, you yeah, know, that's a deficiency of stress NG, really. So Syscaller is more of a fuzz tester, right? In your, Absolutely. Stress NG is doing different various things in terms of uh, regression testing and performance testing and stress testing. Yeah. So it's a different I don't domains. know that I would compare Syscaller and stress ng in the sense that that would be shortchanging stress ng in some 
well, the problem is I've had I've had people saying, "Oh, it stresses all the system calls. Why aren't you using syscaller?" It's like, yeah, but it's different. So I, that's why I, that's 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 why I want to kind of point out that yeah. I'm really trying to um, produce corner case bugs where when like you've run out of resources in various different ways, you know, maybe a driver is not checking a pointer correctly when it allocates memory and that fails, mm -hmm. and then you get a kernel crash, or you know, there's a locking issue because I'm running multiple threads on a device and letting go or opening it in, in a kind of racy way and bugs pop out. So right. that, that that's that's the kind of the concept of stress and is just to force out these weird corner case issues. And, and with the coverage allows me to actually look at where corner cases aren't being exercised. So I can actually try and think of ways of <laughs> creatively exercise and tickle those error paths. So I have one more question. The mm. smart you mentioned the smart. What is smart stand for? I don't. I don't think it. Um, I do not remember off the top of my head okay. the, the what that acronym stands <laughs> for, but it's an industry standard um, way of getting various drive metrics from a disk drive or SSD or even I think NVMe drives sometimes support it, mm -hmm. and it, it basically tells you things like read error rates and it's useful for um, detecting. Maybe you know if, if sectors are going wrong and it's doing sector redirection to cover up bugs, uh, faults on this disk. You know it's good a good way of capturing oh, my disk is starting to fail early when running a stress test. Yeah. And I can uh, look I, it up. I just wondered. If yeah, I, I, I can't remember. What, it's an industry standard term which I've completely forgotten. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens with standard terms. I use them and then I don't always remember them. Yeah. So I have one more question for mm -hmm. you. Um, what are your thoughts on hooking stress and gene to K self test uh, in terms of if um, I were to say um, I could I could write this um, a script uh, shell script that exercises it picks a kind of a, a a few classes and runs them through on test strings. So is um, that I think that's a good thing? idea. Yeah. Um... And you know, we there are different ways of it. I, I, I think the tricky part is getting stress ng for your system because if you do right. like apt get whatever, you're going to get an old version because because right. I push out releases literally monthly. Right. But um, someone kindly has provided a way of building it in Docker um, just this last week, so you can now get a Docker build and get the latest and greatest. So and there's also snaps if you want to use those, but um, okay. they're not my favorite. <laughs> right. So, you know, there are different ways, or, or you could just build it from source. The, the cool mm -hmm. thing about stress and is if you don't have all the support libraries, you can still build it. It'll just lose functionality. Yeah. So, you know, it should build cleanly out of the box with the compilers you've got. So. Well, so that, yeah, I might explore that option. And then last question, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Mm. It is, have you ever considered um, making stress and part of the kernel? Um, no. Like um, part of when? You know? Um, well, we could do that, but I, I'm, I'm kind of more, um, I want to decouple it from the kernel because okay. it really is, I, my intent is to make it so it's useful across lots of different kernels. Right. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, pushing commits into the kernel means it has to go through another layer of <laughs> indirection. So, right. you know. <laughs> so it looks like there are overlaps between perf tool and stress ng in terms of performance. Is Would you say that's at um, accurate? No, well, no, well, no. perf is, is great for monitoring stuff mm -hmm. which you write. You know, it's brilliant for that. I use the perf interface um, to exercise stuff with stress ng as an extra kind of way of getting metrics. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Perf is a great, great tool, and combined with stress NT, it's just nice to be able to validate that some of these stress tests are doing what you think they're meant to be doing. So that's one of the reasons of having Perf there. Um, but also, you know, it's good to see <laughs> if you know you can actually drive a system really hard. See if you can actually maximize the number of instructions per second or your memory bandwidth. And Perf is very good at giving you some very deep statistics. So to see if stress and is doing what it says on the lid, you know. Like. <laughs> cool. So I think those those are my questions. Mm. And then, um, how are we doing on time? Let well, I've got I've got I've got a few more slides, so we can zip okay. through those. Because um, okay. um, if we if we just go through those, I'll be quick. Okay. Um, cool. Um, yeah, we can ignore that. Just to say, you can you can use the cyclic stressor for doing real time and low level kernel benchmarking. Read the slide. Come back to me, folks, if you want to know about that, because it's actually really quite handy. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, yeah, we'll move on. Next slide, please. Um, I've got some evil stress tests like generating system management interrupts. And that requires a pathological flag because it is really horrible. And their ways of booming, their ways of exercising P states and their ways of locking the bus, which is really useful in VMs causing noisy neighbor problems. So they're evil ways you can use stress ng. So treat with caution. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to emphasize that stress ng has been designed the last few years to be really portable. So it, it does a paralyzed auto detection of all the APIs and features you've got with your C headers, the compiler features, what assembly instructions are supported with your, with your tool chain. And I've got it to build with TCC, Clang, TCC, PCC, and the Intel compiler. And it builds most of those with zero warnings on the pedantic warning messages. So it's, it's really clean code. And it compiles and runs on all those lots of different architectures. And I've also got it running on a lot of different operating systems. And again, you can use glibc or muscle C as well. So I've tried to make it really portable. And I'm really interested if other folk want to try it out on different systems where I haven't tried it. For example, if anyone's got access to AIX, it'd be nice to see if it builds and runs on there. <laughs> but try it, on a, try it out on different kernels, different operating systems, different tool chains. If they're bugs, let me know and we'll get it even more portable. Next slide, please. So very simple to clone the repository if you want to build it. Go into the uh, stress and D directory, just type make clean and make, make install. And if you want to get the manual, make a PDF. Um, obviously, you need to build dependencies for making the PDF and you need the tool chain. <laughs> but basically, that's it. There's a readme, dot, uh, a readme file with stress and G, which tells you all the libraries you need to install for different um, distros. And that way, you get the full set of functionality with stress and G. But if you don't have those libraries, you can still build and run stress and G with less support. So I try and make it so it builds cleanly out of the box and will work. Uh, so that's about it there. Um, and next slide, please. Um, just to say the way it's structured, the stress and G.C is the main stress test. There's the core support files, which do all the kind of magic shimming around interfaces and abstraction. Uh, stress and T.C, all the stresses, the test directories and the Debian um config um and basically two make files just run make at the top level and it'll do all the stuff for you that's it for that and i think we're down to the final slides now next slide please yeah as i say i'm i'm really heavily making things work correctly so i do static analysis on stress and g for release it i build up lots of compilers i test it on lots of different operating systems on lots of architectures and most of this done i've got 90 virtual machines set up to do the testing to make sure it really is not buggy when I release it. The bugs still do escape, but I try and minimize that with thorough testing. Next slide, please. Yeah, and for people who really want to get on involved with Stress and G, be great if um, people can see if we can improve the IOPTAL coverage across different drivers, add more networking support. There's the new family of mount system calls I haven't even uh, um, um, implemented yet. Um, it's always worked to keep it in sync with new kernels. And X86 has been focused a lot in stress and G and other targets would be really useful for different architectures. And the kernel is majority driver code. Stress and G should be testing drivers better to find more bugs. I think most of the bugs now are in the kernel drivers. So, you know, that's where we can focus next on getting stress and G to be better. Uh, I think we're down to the final slide now, please. Yeah, just to say, got 180 stressors, we found 45 kernel bugs, um, micro scheduling with both, uh, sorry, the micro benchmarkings found 15 or so kernel improvements. And that's through the zero day CI integration Linux um, project. Stress and T is being used by lots of, well, it's fairly, well, quite a few distros for kernel regression checking. People are using it now for research in the cloud domain. And it's also being used to check for micro code regressions by some folk. So, you know, it's getting a lot of use. And I do get feedback on how it's being used. But if you're using Stress NG in a really interesting way, let me know and see if we can improve it for you. Um, final thought, final part, this is the um, place where everything's kept. So please, please refer to those URLs and the manual. Please read the manual before asking me questions. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's about it, really. Thank you, Colin.
a great presentation. Sorry, there's a lot of content there. Um, there's a lot of features and stress and so apologies if I overrun. Colin, do you want to see if anybody has any final questions? If you have a couple yeah. of minutes. Yeah, sure. Let's wait for some questions. Okay. Um, the other thing is I'm very approachable. Send me an email <laughs> or report bugs on the project, project site and I'll try and get answers to you pretty quickly, normally a day or so unless I'm on holiday. So it looks like somebody uh, posted uh, smart self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology. That, that seems to be the, the abbreviation smart stands for. Oh yes, yeah, that's handy. Oh, one more message. Uh, just questions about the slides being shared. Um, I suppose they'd be shared after this um, somewhere on the Linux Foundation website. Yes, they will be yeah. shared on the on your landing page on the Linux Foundation website. Also, thank you. And I think I'll probably put the slides in in the um, as a PDF in the repository as well, if that's okay. Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, well, if anybody doesn't have, you know, there are no more questions, and I think we can let everyone go. But thank you so much, Colin and Chua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just again, a quick reminder, this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. And we will have a copy of the presentation slides on the Linux Foundation website on that landing page where you went to register. So we hope you will join us for future mentorship sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.